Helping bring you this event, Sedgwick Funeral Homes, Bartonville, Farmington, and Canton, Remax Traders Unlimited, Susie McMillan, your agent, by Spooner Animal Clinic, located on the north edge of Canton, Stereo Village on South 4th Avenue in Canton, by Canton Wesley United Methodist Church, located on North Avenue A, and by M. Bixler Video Productions, call us for more information about underwriting. Helping bring you this event, Monocle's Pizza on North 5th Avenue in Canton. In Canton, we deliver the Bank of Farmington, located in Farmington and in Canton, by Canton Napa, located on North 1st Avenue in Canton. Big Horse Vineyard, located east of Lewistown. Canton Lambs of God Daycare and Preschool, located on North Avenue A in Canton. And by M. Bixler Video Productions, want a DVD? Call us for more information. For Canton, it would have meant that we probably would not have been able to open school. We would have had to, uh, we could have opened school gone through all of our reserves and then been forced to borrow money to uh, reopen. And that would have meant um, a tax increase for the local taxpayer. To me, as a taxpayer and a citizen of the state of Illinois, what is extremely disappointing is the fact that there's many legislatures that uh, are surprised in a tax increase. And don't be mistaken, there is not one person in the House, in the Senate, and in the governor's office that clearly understood that the only way out of this crisis was a tax increase. For example, uh, Governor Rauner proposed an identical tax increase in his proposed budget and included a one cent per ounce sugary drink tax. So clearly, everybody in Springfield understood there was no way out of this crisis without um, a tax increase. We're here tonight to talk about a mechanism to fund schools. Even though the budget was adopted, there was a component that was not included in it, and that was uh, a calculation on how to distribute money to schools. Without a calculation or a mechanism to distribute revenue to schools, uh, schools will not be funded this fall. Uh, tonight, uh, people that are participating are uh, former Canton school, school superintendent and uh, Galesburg superintendent Ralph Grimm, uh, Teresa Ramos, who works for uh, Fix the Formula, and uh, Todd Fox from Southeast Eastern School District. Uh, in closing, I would like to recognize some local people who work very hard to see that the budget was adopted. Uh, the first person is Phyllis Todd from FMCS. If you're here, would you please stand? Joey Brewer, a member of the Church of the Brethren and Cuba High School teacher. Missy Kowalski, Health and Wellness Clinic. Kurt Oldfield, Spoon River College. Daryl Coleman, member of First Christian Church. Harold Rose, member of the Church of the Bread Brethren and Canton High School teacher. Amy Bivens, at Sunset Nursing Home. Rhonda Morgan, Salvation Army. Reverend Kevin Kessler, Church of the Brethren. Reverend Nina Nesselrud, First Christian Church and uh, CAMA president. Reverend Micah Garnett, Trinity Lutheran Church. Father Rob Goebel, St. Peter's Anglican Church, Colin Davis, member of Church of the Brethren, and Amanda Atchley, Chamber of Commerce. Could we have a round of applause for these people? <laughs> Most importantly, and, and I'm almost done, uh, there are a group of people that I refer to as the Forgotten 15. There are 15 legislatures uh, that demonstrated a bipartisan uh, compromise and voted for this budget and have been vilified for doing so. There's a lot of misinformation out, um, untruthfulness on why they voted for it, but quite simply they voted for it to save the state of Illinois. 
Uh, Noreen Hammond, who couldn't be with us tonight, who's from Macomb, and Representative Mike Eunice uh, was another legislature. I do want to show briefly uh, Representative Eunice's floor speech, which is very brief on a reason why he voted uh, in a bipartisan manner to support uh, the taxpayers, the state of Illinois, and save the state. This quite possibly could be the toughest vote that you take. I know that's the case for me. I voted yes on the amendment and I'm voting yes on third reading. And let me just take a few minutes to explain why. First of all, nobody should celebrate should this bill pass. Because we should have never gotten to this point to begin with. It is shameful and it is embarrassing. And never should we have gotten to the point where we are literally on the brink of collapse for the state of Illinois. Come tomorrow morning at the open of business, if we don't get this done, we will become the first state in the history of the United States of America the first state in the history of the United States of America to be in junk bond status. After that point, regardless of whatever deal we get, it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars more to get the deal done. Not to mention, the trajectory that we are on right now is immoral. We have to have a budget. We have to have a budget. Healthcare providers are owed billions of dollars. Small business owners are carrying the weight on their shoulders for the entire state. Their lines of credit have dried up. Their vendors are cutting them off. What are we going to do with those people that suddenly have nowhere to live? What's the game plan? Is the National Guard going to take them? Are we shipping them off to other states? We're broke. We have no money. We have to have a budget. And for goodness sakes, do I have to explain why it's important for our kids to go to school come this fall? In my district, there is a very, very high likelihood that the Canton School District will not open. The simple truth is that without this, we will lose thousands of lives and thousands of jobs. And the alternative is so much worse. I don't like this. This isn't easy. This is really, really difficult. But the alternative is much worse than this. The alternative is literally taking our state off the cliff. We need to end this. This needs to stop. Now I know that by voting for this, there's going to be threats, there's going to be bullying tactics. They're already happening because the fact of the matter is both sides have extreme fringe groups that don't always tell the truth, believe it or not. And both sides are doing that and there's no trust in this place. This environment, all we have is a very toxic environment with political gotchas. It's got to end. It has to stop. We can't continue to do this to our state. At the end of the day, I'm going to be able to rest easy because I'm going to know that we've saved billions of dollars in spending, we've saved hundreds of millions of more by avoiding junk bond status, and we've saved lives, and we've saved jobs. Now many of us talk all the time, and we have big issues and we have small issues. And you have to decide, and we, we, we compromise, and you have to decide, is this the sword that I'm going to die on? And sometimes you have to turn the other way and say, no, i got to pick my battles. But for me today, right here, right now, this is the sword that I am willing to die on. And if it costs me my seat, then so be it. I carry with me all the time a poem. And many people that know me know me well. 
that I have this, these words with me at all times. And I just want to share these words with you briefly. Because I think the body could, could help with this. And it'll, I'll be very brief. It says, it's the Anyway poem, and it's made famous by Mother Teresa. And it says, people are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, give the world the very best you have, and it may never be enough, but give the world the very best you have anyway. Now, I am not perfect, but I try very, very hard to live my life that way. And I assure you that I give this job the very best that I have every day. And I urge you to please, to please consider voting yes on this so that we can put this insanity behind us once and for all and avoid being the first state in the history of the United States to go into junk bond status. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would like to turn over the microphone to Mr. Todd Fox. Thank you for this opportunity to say a few words. My name is Todd Fox. I'm the superintendent of the Southeastern School District. We're right in between Quincy and Macomb, a district K through 12 of 520 students. Perception can become the reality unless you address perceptions. So let's address the perception so that we can focus on the reality. On July 6th, the House overrode the governor's veto. Senate Bill 6, 9, and 42, the budget, the revenue, the implementation, they were passed. That there was and is a perception that as soon as all that happened on July 6th, the table was set and dinner was about to be served for school districts. We had a budget and we had the revenue to fund that budget. But that is not the reality. The reality is this. The table might be set, but without the governor signing Senate Bill 1, we have no way of getting food on the table. We need to have an evidence-based funding formula signed into law by the governor, and we need that now. Three questions. Question one. What will happen if Senate Bill 1 is not signed into law? All schools fall in three categories. Category 1, they do not open next month. This is not grandstanding, this is the truth. Some schools will not open next month without the signing of Senate Bill 1. Category 2, some schools will open next month but there is no way they can continue throughout the school year without the signing of Senate Bill 1. And then you have Category 3. Some schools can stay open the entire year, but will deplete the reserves to do so. The reserves that they work so hard to build up, to protect, and to manage responsibly. All schools fall in those three categories, one of those three categories. But here's a category all of us fall under. Once again, our young people are being used as political pawns and educational guinea pigs. And that's for all of us. Question number two, what does Senate Bill 1 mean for my school district? A an extra $40,000 a year. 
B, a funding formula that is fair. The neediest students are taken care of first. And C, and maybe the most important, it gives you and I confidence that our state understands our most prized possession, and that is the education of young people. We have a confidence in the governor, the General Assembly, the process. Senate Bill 1 gives us that confidence. Number three, why Senate Bill 1 versus other House bills that are out there? Senate Bill 1 is not perfect. You and I know that. But sometimes, many times, perfect is the enemy to good. If we wait for perfect, we won't get good. And Senate Bill 1 is good. Another reason why, Senate Bill 1 has passed both houses. It's ready for the governor to sign. We know that to be a fact. And the third thing, at Southeastern, other bills might give us more money if we wait, if we hang on, if we believe. We are not in position to wait. We need funding now. In closing, it is important that all of us do whatever we can, as soon as we can, to get Senate Bill 1 signed into law. The table is set. The food is ready. It is time for us to eat. Every state has a vision. If that vision does not start and end, but the proper education of young people, you are simply building your house on the sand. For us right now, it's not perfect, but for us right now, Senate Bill 1 is our rock. Thank you for your time. Well done, Todd. Very well done. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Ralph Grimm. I recently retired as the superintendent of the Galesburg School District. After 33 years as a public school educator, the last 21 as a school district superintendent. I live here in Canton and have done so uh, since 1999. I lived here with my family. We had three boys go through the Canton School District. I spent my entire career working on funding reform in this state. For the first time in 20 years, we are close to seeing true, meaningful reform. I can't walk away from that yet. Just too much time of my career has been invested in this. Before I uh, make the rest of my remarks, there are some people in the audience that I want to, uh, to recognize. Uh, I think we have two regional superintendents here this evening, Jody Scott from ROE 33 and John Meixner from ROE 26. Would you two stand, please? John and Jody, thank you for being here. We have several board members uh, from school districts across this part of the state uh, from um, the Southeastern School District to uh, Monmouth and a little bit north. If you're a school board member here tonight, would you please stand? Thank you to all of you for being here tonight and for your service. And I'm also very, very proud to note that there are several school district superintendents from the western region and the western part of the state in attendance tonight. Would you also stand, please? the superintendents who are here tonight. These are the people who are wrestling with the consequences of the situation that we find ourselves in in Springfield. Instead of being in preparation for the opening day of school, which is about a month away, these folks are asking the question, are we going to get our funding? Will it come in time? Will it be a whole year's worth of funding? Can we open on time? Can we stay open? Todd's done an eloquent job pointing that out. That's not how it should be. That's not how these people should be spending their time. But that's how it has been and it continues to be. 
It has been mentioned that we now have a budget for the first time in two years. I know there's a lot of angst that's been created by the passage of that budget and the action of local legislators, but I too want to add my thanks to Representative Eunice and Representative Hammond. Those two took courageous votes to save the state. Now consider a couple of facts. $22 million a day is being spent on interest on the bonds that the state has taken out over the last 20 years. $22 million a day, 365 days a year. That's over $800 million in interest on an annual basis. Not one of those dollars goes to make a positive impact on any resident of this state, any student in any of our schools. It doesn't benefit any community. It makes the bond salespeople richer. $800 million a year. Spending was approximately $39 billion a year. Much of it was court ordered. We were spending at 2015 levels. And it was by court order. The 2015 level of $39 billion was significantly more than what was proposed by the governor in the last two budgets. So we're going to save some money um, by avoiding the court ordered spending. Simply put, the nonsense of this situation had to stop. Illinois residents were being harmed by this situation. The impact of no budget to local school districts uh, has been significant as well. We have dealt with, since the 2011-2012 school year, a little thing called proration of our general state aid. The state uh, supports local school districts through the payment of general state aid. It's based on a somewhat calculated formula, but it's the state's portion of providing a high quality education to the two million students who attend public school in this state. Beginning with the 2011-2012 school year, the state decided that they couldn't pay a dollar's worth of general state aid for a dollar that they owed. They prorated it. The first proration was at 92%, so that means that instead of a dollar, the state paid 92 cents. That proration continued through the 2015-2016 school year. During that time, the Canton School District did not receive $3.5 million due to proration. The Galesburg School District, my last school district, did not receive approximately $7.8 million due to proration. In addition to that, this year, this past school year, school districts were forced to deal with lack of payment of mandated categoricals. Mandated categoricals are the things that the state requires a local school district to do, like provide transportation for students who live more than a mile and a half from the school, and other programs. The net effect of that was Again, Canton lost about a million dollars last year in non-payment of the mandated categoricals and the Galesburg district was at about 1.4 million. As a result, both districts have experienced significant budget reductions due to that loss of revenue. Programs have been reduced or eliminated. I know that we had a significant reduction process in Galesburg. The numbers of reductions were staggering. Local property taxes have increased as a result of the proration and the lack of mandated categorical payments. Fees have gone up. The situation's not good. It's not good. But there's another cost to all of this as well. And this is the one that I worry about the most. And that is the fact that our students Students across the state of Illinois have been denied access to a high quality education. And in my opinion, we're losing an entire generation of learners due to this financial situation that none of us created, but all are affected by. We have students who are entering school, hopefully in August, who have gone through six or seven or eight years of proration, budget cuts, lack of mandated categorical reimbursements 
And they don't know anything but diminishing programs, increasing class sizes, loss of extracurricular opportunities, not having the same education that students from all across the state have. And that situation, simply put, is unacceptable. It should be unacceptable to us that children could very soon go through their entire school career in a public school in this state and never really understand what a high quality education is, what the opportunities are. They're going to miss those things forever. That's unacceptable. The quality of a child's education should not depend on their zip code. In too many cases where a child lives determine what type of education they receive. There is a spending disparity that is significant across this state. Some districts are doing all they can to spend $7,000 to $8,000 per student, while other districts can spend $22,000 to $30,000 per student. That situation, too, is not right. It's unacceptable, and it has to stop. All of that brings us to why we are here this evening. Senate Bill 1 is the funding reform bill that, began, that begins to correct the inequitable spending disparities that exist today in our state. It is the funding reform bill that begins to correct the inadequacy of spending that exists today in our state. Now, my good friend, Dr. Teresa Ramos, will explain how this occurs in a few minutes. But for now, however, we have a huge problem. Governor Rahner has threatened to veto Senate Bill 1 the moment it hits his desk. As Mr. Fox so eloquently explained, that's the meal that we want to put on the table that has been prepared for our students and our communities. And we have no way to get that. I'm not going to go into the reasons why the governor may veto Senate Bill 1. There, there are a lot of them. And I'll leave it up to you to decide what you think is best. But trust me when I say, personally, I think Senate Bill 1 is the best way for us to go and would encourage all of you to adopt that philosophy as well. The Fix the Formula Coalition has two basic principles for any reform effort to be supported. They are, one, there are no red numbers for any school district in any new funding model. In other words, no district loses money. And that's a significant piece of Senate Bill 1, because in Senate Bill 1, there are no red numbers. And in my opinion, the second principle is, money should not be taken from the children of one school district and be given to the children of another school district in such a way that the former district loses money and opportunities. And that really is why I'm up here tonight, is to advocate for all 2.1 million children in the state of Illinois, regardless of whether they live in Chicago, East St. Louis, or any point in between. Our most precious resource are our children. We need to take care of them, regardless of where they live. We should support, as a society, a bill that does not harm any child. And I believe Senate Bill 1 is that vehicle. Without the governor's approval of Senate Bill 1, the money contained in the recently approved budget cannot flow to our school districts. It will not flow to our classrooms. Some districts may not be able to open in the fall or be able to stay open the entire year. This is a real crisis with very real and very significant consequences. Strong schools and strong communities go together. You usually don't have one without the other. When schools fail, communities fail. But let's look at the impact on our children. If school's not in session, whether that be in August or in December or in February, Who's going to feed these children? I know that in Galesburg, the low income count approaches 70%. We fed a significant number of our students at least two meals a day, and in a few cases, three. And I suspect the same is true 
to maybe a slightly lesser degree here in Canton and in schools that are represented by the superintendents. What about the lack of educational programming that these children will not be exposed to? Seniors who may not graduate, how do we catch them up if they don't get a full year of school? How do they graduate on time and go on and do what they want to do? Become what they can become? Who will provide supervision for our youngest children? These are real issues that our superintendents who are in the room tonight are facing because of this budget crisis. I'm not here to scare anyone into supporting Senate Bill 1, but I am trying to paint a realistic picture of what's going to happen if schools don't open on time. It's a very, very real possibility unless we get some legislative approval or the governor's approval to have the six billion dollars contained in this year's budget distributed to our schools. Now we're going to uh, hear from uh, Teresa Ramos in a moment and then we'll open the floor up to questions and we'll hopefully be able to provide some answers. But before I conclude, I just really want to say that, you know, part of what we need from you tonight is when you leave, you have a sense of urgency about this crisis. Forget everything else except the children. Because if, if by me standing up here and talking to you about the impact on children doesn't spur you into action, there's not much more any of us can say, frankly. And when you leave tonight, my hope is that you will email the governor's office and encourage him to sign Senate Bill 1. And that tomorrow morning you will pick up the phone and call the governor's office and leave a message that says, Governor Honor, we demand that you sign Senate Bill 1 for the good of the state, but more importantly, for the good of our children. And then do the same thing the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, if that's what it takes, until we get some approval of Senate Bill 1. Watch the social media. I have to compliment uh, Rolf on his efforts in this community. Uh, your efforts on supporting this initiative. It's been fantastic. It's been phenomenal. I think I called Roth Wednesday or Thursday of last week and I said, hey, can we have a town hall meeting in your auditorium at the high school? And he said, sure, when do you want to have it? And I said, next Tuesday night. I think I was in your office, wasn't I? And he swallowed hard and said, uh, yeah, we'll make it happen. And we did and we're so thankful to have so many of you here tonight. Rarely do we get a chance to have such an impact on public policy. You, me, all of us have that chance with this issue. Time is of the essence. Our kids can't wait. We need to get this done and we need to get it done now. So at this time I'd like to introduce uh, Teresa Ramos to uh, talk about Senate Bill 1. You're fine. Can folks see? More or less? Yeah, great. All right. I'm going to try to get through um, what is a lot of uh, content in, in enough time so that way we can have um, a, a good Q&A. So if I don't get through everything, I won't read every piece on every slide but we can have time to talk uh, about this and any questions about how um, some of the budget bills supported this. You guys feel free if you want to hop off, I think that's fine. Um, so for the past four and a half years, uh, my organization, Advance Illinois, has been supporting a coalition funding Illinois' future, just one of these logos on um, this slide that has been organizing to get a better school funding system for Illinois. And this year we had the strongest um, coalition yet, in part because of the principle that no district should lose money. That doesn't mean some districts lose money, it means no districts lose money. Superintendents, parents, teachers, community partners, and just today, we didn't have a chance to do it in time, the Illinois PTA joined our coalition to call for Senate Bill 1. So I just, they're, they're not listed here, but I wanted to just emphasize that today that happened. So. Some folks might have seen these boxes in different forms. I'm just going to pull them up. 
our current funding system is broken. We've heard that, right? We spend less on the kids that need the most, and all of the research shows we should be spending more on kids from low-income communities than, than their wealthier peers. What we've advocated for is not to give every kid the same thing. We know that kids have different needs. They walk into the classrooms with unique uh, learning styles and abilities. What we need is a system that takes into account those needs and takes into account a, a local community's ability to contribute to funding their public education. So we need an equitable and adequate system. So not regressive, spending less on the neediest, not equal, where we're spending the same on everybody, wealthy or um, low income. What we need is fair and equitable, and with a path to what it means to fully fund public education in Illinois. And we are at the cusp of answering, I think, that question. So how did we get here? I won't spend too much time here. Um, but nationally, if we look at other states, most states cover half the total cost of public education, that blue box, with state funding. Those three buckets that make up the funds for public education, state dollars, local dollars, property taxes, and federal dollars. That's that little itty bitty bucket. Most states cover almost half. Illinois covers less than 30%. So the state isn't putting enough in, and that means that over the years, over 20 years, Illinois has been more reliant on property taxes than state dollars. Which, and we know property taxes are more regressive and unfair. They're different across the state. This has been part of the problem uh, with, with the system in Illinois. What I don't have here, uh, just because we don't have a lot of time, but I have it for folks if you're interested, is the way that we were spending those dollars, that 28%, that was through a system of buckets of money. Some went out to everybody equally. Some went out to everybody based on how many low-income students, but didn't take into account if they had wealth in their community. Some went out to, to districts based on how much wealth they had, but didn't take into account if they had any need. It was a bunch of buckets of money that worked against each other and not to one purpose. So we weren't putting enough in from the state, and the way that we were putting it in didn't serve the purpose that it was intended to do, which is to close gaps in inadequacy and equity across the state. All right. So outside partners, national partners, a group called the Educational Trust, in 2015, when we were advocating, we were still advocating for this, said, you know, how do we know? What do we, how, do, how does Illinois and other folks compare in terms of how regressive or progressive their, their funding system is? So for each dollar spent on a non-low-income student, how much are they spending on a low-income student? Ohio does it right by all accounts. They're spending more on low-income students than they are on non-low-income students. Can anyone guess where Illinois is? dead last. Independently verified, we spend less on the neediest kids in our system than on the students who, uh, than on their wealthier peers. So we have to get it right. It is beyond time to do so. So what makes this even worse, we spend less on the neediest kids is, is that poverty and concentrated poverty has grown across the state in the last 10 years. If we look at the map, and this is a map of school districts, right, we're looking at the light shaded areas have less poverty, the darker areas have more poverty. When we look in 2010, we see poverty has grown. We look at 2015, it has grown precipitously. What that means is, really what we have now is 43% of all of the school districts across the state 50% of their students are low income or more, 50% or more. That means more of our school districts, more of our communities are trying to do more for low income students, right? Middle class communities, low income communities, all are trying to do more for low income students and we know we haven't been providing enough. 
In fact, we've been cutting, as I think folks have said, over years. That's our reality. Which brings us to Senate Bill 1. The blue bars are a breakdown of all districts, low-income students across the state. And we break it down in, in this way to show what's happening in our current system. We're funding less than we need to, right, for our neediest kids. This yellow bar is Senate Bill 1, right? For the first time, not only are we creating a system that has evidence base, and I'll go into that in a minute, but that gives us a path to what we should be standing, and we can answer that question, what does an adequate public education cost for my kid in Canton, or my kid in Peoria, or my kid in Chicago, or Cairo? across the state. So we have a, a goalpost and a path to get there. On our website, and if you signed in, uh, in the back with Angelica and others, we will send you this PowerPoint and we'll send you, uh, I think, to Ralph's how to call and how to get active and call the governor. You'll see as we map out how Senate Bill 1 calculates adequacy, and I'll go through this evidence base in a minute, we see, right, that 80% of districts are below adequacy. That this isn't about one part of the state or another, Chicago versus downstate, any, right? All, so many of our districts are, have great need across the state. And this formula takes care of them all. It makes sure that new funding goes to the neediest districts first, and we can show it on the back end with the math, which I'll do um, at the end. I keep pointing this in the wrong direction, sorry. So how does it work? So part of the conversation on evidence on this is what are these evidence-based elements? There are these 27 essential elements of evidence-based practices, practices that research has shown move the needle for academic and other outcomes for students. You take these elements, some of them, if you can see them, are things like smaller class sizes, reading interventionists, student activities, up-to-date textbooks and materials that aren't falling apart, uh, nurses and guidance counselors, technology, things that we know are going to prepare kids to be ready for their future, whatever that is. It takes those 27 elements, and there are sub-elements, and then it says, let's apply them to each unique district. What's your district's enrollment? How many English learners do you have? How many special needs students have, do you have? How many low income students do you have? And take those elements, apply them, cost them out based on regional differences in wages, and I can, I'll say more about that in a second, and you get a district adequacy target. For the first time, Illinois can answer this question. It's a big deal. What should we be spending? How are we going to get there? We will know the answer to that question. It doesn't mean folks won't continue to kind of go back and forth about it, but we have a path to say this is what an adequate public education costs and here's how we're going to get there through these research-based elements. So a little bit about regionalization, and I think this is important because this is one of the things in, the, in Senate Bill 1 that really helps keep downstate and folks outside of the metro Chicago area competitive with everybody else. So when I showed in the other slides that we take these elements and then we regionalize the cost, we do that in, by saying there's a, a group out of tech, University of Texas uh, at Austin that says, what does, looks at every state and says, how much does it cost for a college educated worker in, in every county? And puts it on a scale. And we can see, you know, does it cost 79 cents or over a dollar, right, this scale. The way we use a scale to regionalize, but what happened in Senate Bill 1 is we said, you know what, there should be a floor. Like you see in Johnson County or Adams County or Sangamon County, no, no salary will go below 0.9. Right. We will make sure that salaries, even if they are, real, that, that we can keep salaries competitive in every county. So you, if you send uh, your, your daughter to, or, or son to college to be a teacher at ISU, there's a way for them to come back 
to Fulton County or to come back to Sangamon County or Johnson County because the wages are competitive. So it keeps the wages competitive within a county and it keeps it competitive with Chicago and other areas by saying there's a floor here. And I can go into more of the weeds on that if folks want. So how does it work? So for the first time, we can calculate adequacy, right? And again, it's not the same number for every district. It's based on your unique needs. And then we have to ask, well, how much are we already spending? What do we already have? How much can we pay locally? That is, how much are you able to pay locally based on your local property wealth? And then, because we have taken a principled position that no districts can lose money, we say no districts lose money, none. Right? So that's this base funding minimum that says all districts are held harmless. You can't lose any money from year to year. We know enrollment varies, but we can't lose any money, and it calculates that out. And then this yellow bar is what's the gap? So where are we? What are we currently spending? What's our gap to getting where we know we need to go to fully fund education in our community? And then Senate Bill 1 and the, and the budget bill that Representative Eunice, Representative Hammond, and 70, 71 members across, House members across the state voted on funds, adds funding into the formula that gives, and you can't see the District 3 on the far right, which has the greatest need and the most red bars. It makes sure that new dollars, these dollars that were in the budget, will go to the neediest districts first. Right? No districts lose money, money goes to neediest districts first. I'm going to go through really quickly these slides. I won't say more beyond. We know that property taxes are regressive across the state. Right? And, but they have been, because our state hasn't put in enough state dollars, they've been the only reliable source of income for districts across the state when, when, when the state's in such a financial crisis. This district, this model says, if you are overtaxing, we, because you've been trying hard locally, your community has been supporting your school district, we don't want to penalize you for that. So we allow you to have access to more state dollars to close the gap in the hopes that long term you're able to adjust. If you are under taxing, and there are districts, and those tends to be the wealthiest districts in the state, that can have very low tax rates, but get a lot of money from those tax rates. If you're under taxing, and you, you could be putting in more, we're not going to make you do it. No one wants to make anyone raise taxes or lower taxes, but we're going to have you be less eligible for state dollars and, and show that as part of your effort. And again, I can get into the weeds if folks are interested after we get into Q&A. So quick highlights. Formula ties school funding to evidence-based practices. Uh, it doesn't mandate practices, but it, it ties it to them. Each district is treated individually, has their own adequacy target. The new dollars go to the neediest kids first and then filter up, so it's like fill from the bottom. Uh, it treats Chicago in the same way it treats every other district, and that's what I'm going to go through next because that's been part of the political conversation here, what's happening with Chicago. And no district loses money, no exceptions. And this is a big deal because many statewide advocacy organizations just don't, don't, will not support in a fiscal climate like this any district losing dollars, even if, as I showed you on that map, and hopefully everybody has this handout. On this map, those blue districts that are over 100%, some as high as 250% of their adequacy target, so they're spending over double, right, you know, of what they should, make sure that no district really loses money. And this is interactive, and you can go on the website and play with it. All right. So a little bit about our core values. I won't hit this too hard. Recognizes individual student need. The formula must do that. It must account for differences in local resources. It must close funding gaps and keep them closed. And we should be able to sh show that over time. And provides a, a sta stability and security in a system that hasn't been stable or secure in a long time. SB1 meets those requirements. So what does it do? 
85% of all new dollars go to districts. If you think about that map that had districts dealing with high concentrations of poverty, 85% of the dollars go to those districts that have over 50% or more students that are low income or in concentrated poverty. Roughly 70% of all the dollars go to districts with low to medium property wealth. Downstate students receive 34.5% of new formula dollars and they have 34% of the students. Chicago students receive 20% of the new formula dollars for about 19% of the students. And they have a third of the state's low income students in their district and the highest levels of concentrated poverty. So what this tells us is the bill is doing what it's supposed to do. It is going to the neediest districts first. It is going to, it's going proportionally out across the state. And I'll go through a few things on Chicago because these are questions and I'm happy to get into this in Q&A as well. So what happens to Chicago? So Chicago is, it's like I said, 20% of the funding for about 20% of the students. The Chicago block grant is sunset. That means these mechanics that were this carve out for Chicago, uh, and there's a lot of different folklore out there about how we got to this place, which I'm happy to, and everybody has their stories. Those, those mechanics go away. Those formulas go away. CPS then has to go through this claim process that, they ha that, they, that every other district has gone through. CPS now has to go through that same process. They're held accountable in the same way. They must go through that same process. But they cannot lose money. That means just like every other previous grant that was in this formula, frank, flat grants, poverty grants, all of those grants go into a district's hold harmless and CPS is the same and calculates adequacy the same way for all districts to ensure that there's no red numbers. A big part of the conversation has been Chicago pensions. And this is where we get into the lore. Some folks say Chicago pensions funds started first. They were the first school district to start their own pension funds and then the teacher's retirement system came later. So Chicago has their own pension system, Illinois has a pension system. Chicago, Illinois, for all school districts in the state, the state of Illinois picks up the costs of teacher pensions. What that means is there's two ways that folks talk about pensions. Normal cost of pensions for every teacher moving forward and then unfunded liability costs from previous years. At a state level, for all districts outside of Chicago, the state is picking up $862 million in normal cost of pensions for every district except Chicago. For the unfunded liability, every school district, the collective unfunded liability for those school districts is $2.6 billion not Chicago. In this bill, Chicago, it, it recognizes two things. It brings Chicago into parity with the rest of the state by Chicago must pay their, like there's gonna get a, they're gonna get a $221 million pension payment. That is the same as that 869 million normal cost of payment for the rest of the state. And then it says, we, we know that Chicago's on the hook for paying their, prop, their own pension payment. They have to pay their banks that pension payment. Those dollars that they have to get locally cannot also be spent to, in the classroom, getting Chicago to adequacy. So the formula takes that into account. It doesn't give Chicago additional, additional credit. It says we have to account for the fact that Chicago can't use the same tax dollars twice, both to pay pensions and their banks, and then also to use that to get kids the resources they need in the classroom. That's what Senate Bill 1 does for Chicago. So when we look at what this means and how we me measure what, if the bill is doing what it's supposed to be doing, we can bucket it out. We do a quintile analysis of the state and then you show what, what CPS gets in the formula. And you'll see, right, the formula is equitable. Districts that have between 66 and 100% low income students get the most money from this new formula. Right? You see where Chicago is, you see where districts that have less low income students are, 
the formula is doing the right thing. It is driving dollars to those parts of the state that are orange and red and have the most need. Same thing when we look at property wealth. Does it take into account local resources? We can look at it and again say the formula is doing the right thing. It is driving the most funding to property poor districts and then down from there. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll invite folks to come up, is I, I agree um, with our previous speakers. There's no such thing as perfect policy. What's baked into this model is an evaluation system that every three years we can look and say, is the formula doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it getting dollars where it needs to go? Is there anything happening that shouldn't be happening in the formula? And then readjust. Our best defense against having the broken system that we had in the past is to make sure that we continue to have conversations like these where we can talk about what's working and what's not. And this formula for the first time, parents and community partners across the state can say, here's what, what's in the formula. How is my district spending the dollars? I have a road map to actually look at these practices and ask good questions, not only of my school districts, but of the state and say, what are we doing and what do we need to do to get to equity and adequacy in the formula? And I'll pause there and, and we can open up for questions and conversation. Yeah. Is there anybody like to come up and ask this uh, conferees questions? <clears throat> Can you come forward? Uh, I just had a question. Uh, what is the absolute last date in order for this to pass that Canton can open and function? At this point, that's unknown. Can folks hear me if I speak really loud? So just where, we, where we're at is in the process is the Senate has this bill. It passed out of the General Assembly with the bare minimum votes. And the Senate hasn't yet released it to the governor because they want folks time to really get to understand the ins and outs of the bill. If the governor signs it, great. We're all, we can immediately give safety and security to districts. If he doesn't, then it has to go through the process just like the budget did. And then there are different clocks depending on that. And, and every district is at a different point. I think Todd and, and Ralph mentioned this. Some districts are already crisis planning. They don't know if they can open. Some are borrowing money to see if they can keep open till October. Every district is in a little bit of a different shape here based on unique things that are happening in their community. Our plan is uh, to wait and see what happens within the next two weeks. Uh, if there is no movement on it, we will confer a um, meeting with uh, board presidents, find out what every other school district is planning on doing, and then possibly conduct a town hall meeting, uh, a listening meeting to find out what um, our community members and stakeholders feel. Can you come down in front, please? I would just say that I'm just coming to the front. August 10th appears to be the next big day for the school district. Um, uh, there is no general state aid anymore. The government signs the same goes on the order of the change of the school. It will be due on August 10th. Without that payment, uh, hitting the bank at midnight on August 10th, some of our school districts will be moved from crisis planning to crisis implementation. So that's a very, very critical day for us to do previous work. 
my question at hand is uh, who's going to manage this system? Because unlike some, I don't believe in our political people in Springfield handling the situation. Uh, yes, it's nice what Mike Unez did at the end, but it, he has also fallen down on us a lot. So who actually oversees this? I mean, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, it is, so this is, a, is, the, is the formula, right? It is the way that we can distribute the dollars to districts in the state. Districts then still have local control about how they use those dollars. And I will say, in a system that has had been cut for years, and where we haven't had a full budget, and we're missing cap payments, two big payments from the state, the, these money, if Senate Bill 1 gets signed and the funds get released, we're just going to stop the bleeding for a little while. And that's what local districts are going to have to do, right? They can't, they can't promise implementation of all of these things that are based on adequacy for a little bit of time. So it's local control at school district level, right? And then there is a state panel that every few years looks at, I think it's three, looks at the formula and says, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? What else needs to be done? The, the dollars will go to the school board and the school district to decide how, how, where they need to plug holes and where they need to invest over time as more dollars come in. Every year we will still advocate for the system to be in line and I'll let other folks um, weigh in. There's a, 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 a state panel of not just legislators but of practitioners who will say is this for the state doing what it should be doing. So. I think what your question is, who's going to do the actual calculation? Correct. And if I'm not mistaken, it would be the State Board of Education. Uh, <clears throat> after the calculation is determined and what the revenue is, then it's distributed from Springfield, the actual cash is through a wire transfer into uh, our uh, banking institutions. 70 to 80 percent of every school district's overhead is labor. It's uh, uh, salaries, uh, benefits, um, um, you know, supplies. So what we do when we begin the budget process, first of all, we calculate exactly what our costs are. We'll go through and we'll determine what all our salaries are through all our employees. And that includes uh, not only teachers, but bus drivers, custodians, our maintenance employees, and administrators. And then accordingly, we plug that into our budget and determine um, uh, where, what line item that's going to go in, and then that's how we develop the budget. Basically, there is a ways and means to say that Springfield is doing these numbers correctly and giving us the right amount and not shipping it yes. to the other amount. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that's an excellent question because what uh, uh, Mr. Grimm mentioned when he had a conversation earlier in the week, he went through all the past payments from Springfield and determined um, over how many years? Five million dollars they shorted us on and at the same time because of that we had a school board that was very conservative and wanted to keep the budget balanced and the district solvent which is what you should do as a school board in a school district not knowing you're not going to get this money and then keep on spending at the same levels and drive the district into the ground. So as a result, uh, we had to align our staffing with the money we had and because of, this, of the state not funding schools, class sizes went way up, uh, probably 25%. Uh, we've been very lucky. Uh, we haven't had to cut any programs yet, but in the absence of a funding mechanism like Senate Bill 1, all bets are off. No funding whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? Anybody? Well, I want to say that was that Mr. Kurt Olson, president of the Senior College this year. You know, for all the difficulty we've had K-12, uh, the difficulty that's been imposed on our higher ed system is, has been twice as bad in some respects. 
And um, I don't know that uh, Senate Bill 1 will, will help you, but uh, I'm glad the budget got passed because I think $800 million was released this week to uh, the community colleges and universities, and, and uh, that was sorely needed money to help continue to provide post-high uh, post school uh, education for our, for our students and our, and our citizens. So um, appreciate you being here, Kurt, as well. Are there any other questions? that we can answer. Can you can you come down forward so everybody can hear you please? Sorry about that. Because <laughs> you might be asking the same question that somebody else wants to ask. I'm sure you are when you mention the governor. <laughs> I just wondered why does the governor not want to sign this? I'm so glad that So now I have an opportunity to do it. Um, so just yesterday, the governor had a press conference, and he said there's two things that he doesn't like about the bill, and they're all about Chicago. The two things that he wants to do if he vetoes this bill is to cut Chicago's normal cost of pensions out, that $221 million, and to cut 200 to $250 million, I don't know the exact number, from Chicago's block grant. That is funding that Chicago previously got that they want to cut. That's why he doesn't like this bill, because no district loses money, including Chicago, and Chicago's normal cost of pensions is in the bill. Now, I think that's a good thing, that Chicago's normal cost of pensions are in the bill. Because when I talk about all of this lore about where things are at and why we don't like a formula of these buckets here and these buckets there, is because having an integrated formula that means protection, I think, for Chicago and protection for every other district in the state. There's one bucket, if you want more money, you have got to advocate for more money into a bucket that goes to all districts in this equitable and adequate way. If we pull Chicago pensions out and put it in something separate, how tempting is that to just say, well, Chicago needs more money, we're gonna put it in this extra bucket over here that doesn't go to everybody in the same way. So it ensures Chicago gets normal cost of pension payments, but it sure ensures every other district, right, that if Chicago or a DuPage County or a Christian County wants more money, they have to advocate for more money that goes to every district in the state. And I think that's the best protection for all of us in the formula. I'm just going to repeat something that I said earlier because for me it's simpler than that. This is about kids. If we don't advocate for all kids, who does? I don't care if it's a Chicago kid or a Canton kid or a Galesburg kid or an East St. Louis kid or a Carbondale kid. I've been all around the state talking about this. I've seen kids from all around the state. It doesn't matter. They're kids. And what cost do we incur if we don't educate them properly? What cost do we incur down the road as a state if they're not productive, contributing members of this society? And I know that sounds kind of Pollyannish and pie in the sky, but I've dedicated my life to kids, as has Rolf and Todd and all the superintendents and regional superintendents and Kurt. This isn't about anything else to me except what are we going to do to, to help kids? It doesn't matter where they live, in my opinion. And that's what we need to, that's the message that I think we need to tell the governor. Stop playing zip code politics. Do what's right for kids. Do what's right for the state as a whole. That's what it comes down to. And that's why it's so important for you to leave here tonight and send an email to the governor. Forget about the politics, forget about the games, forget about Mike Madigan or Bruce Rahner or any, anything that's happened in the past, that's done and over with. We can't do anything about it. But think about your children, your grandchildren. That's what it comes down to. Every generation pays it forward for the generation of kids to come. And that's really what we're advocating for, in my opinion. This is a far better way to pay for education than we've had the last 20, 30, 35 years. And so please keep that in mind uh, when you think about what you've heard tonight. The numbers are great, SB1 is great, but really why are we here? It's because everyone in this room, I have to believe, is here because you care about kids and we want to do right by the next generation of school children who attend public school in this state.
Any questions? Can you come down front, please? Sorry to make you walk. And I might not be aware of this, but is there any stipulation in SB 1 to keep our legislators from borrowing from the teachers' pension funds again and not paying it back? There isn't that I know of. But, but I'll say one more thing, which is, this is one of the strongest coalitions I think the state has ever seen of advocates from all, all corners of the state. And I think there are more people like you who've come to town halls who are trying to figure out what is in this, like how do we get ourselves out of this? And that is the best protection, right, is to have a knowledgeable citizenry to push on their legislators and to keep them from doing the right thing, keep them doing the right things. I mean, that's the best thing that we can do. There's not anything else in the legislation. That's our best bet. Any other questions? Um, I just want to say one thing. Everybody uh, in this room from Canton, by coming to these town hall meetings and to budget impasse for them, I can tell you 100% you got their attention. Uh, I got phone calls uh, all the way into the Senate President's office. Uh, certainly the governor's staff knew that we were having these meetings and absolutely you got their attention. We sent a, uh, went down to Springfield with uh, a pa two pastors and their third grade son and Kurt Oldfield and myself and this little boy walked in the governor's office and gave the governor's secretary 400 signatures, walked uh, upstairs to the speaker's office, gave him 400 signatures, uh, walked to David Kaler's office, gave him 400 signatures, and then across the street to the Stratton building, and then my phone started ringing. So don't think for one minute that these meetings are a waste of time, because I guarantee you right now, you're getting their attention. This is how we do it. A grassroots movement. And it might as well start tonight in Canton, Illinois. Thank you very much. I just want to thank you for coming. And, and again, I want to make one more plea. When you leave tonight, go home and tell one person what you heard tonight. And encourage them to send that email and make that phone call. We can do this. Our kids are depending on us. Let's get this done. Thank you for being here. Helping bring you this event, Sedgwick Funeral Homes, Bartonville, Farmington, and Canton, Remax Traders Unlimited, Susie McMillan, your agent, by Spoon River Animal Clinic, located on the north edge of Canton, Stereo Village on South 4th Avenue in Canton, by Canton Wesley United Methodist Church, located on North Avenue A, and by M. Bixler Video Productions, call us for more information about underwriting. Helping bring you this event, Monocle's Pizza on North 5th Avenue in Canton. In Canton, we deliver the Bank of Farmington, located in Farmington and in Canton, by Canton Napa, located on North 1st Avenue in Canton. Big Horse Vineyard, located east of Lewistown, Canton Lambs of God Daycare and Preschool, located on North Avenue A in Canton, and by M. Bixler Video Productions, want a DVD? Call us for more information.